Hi there, I'm Fred Trost, your outdoor reporter on Michigan Weekend, and tonight I have lots of fishing news to report on. And I'm Kathy Fleck, reporting on travel around our great state, and on this edition of Michigan Weekend, we'll head north to a well-known attraction, Mackinac City and Fort Michelin Mackinac. We'll also visit the Kellogg Bird Sanctuary near Battle Creek, a southern Michigan attraction that's interesting any time of year. We're going to give you a few minutes to solve the identity of this mystery fish. It's a recent state record. In the past, it's been an insignificant sports fish. Most anglers, it seems, have only caught them by accident. But lately, people have been taking them more seriously, and these fish have been stirring up a lot of interest in the sports fishing world. If you enjoy bowling and you'd like to improve your game, now's the time to buy your bowling ball from the Sporting Goods Department at Meyer Thrifty Acres. Meyer always has why pay more prices on bowling shoes, bags, and accessories, but this week the spotlight is on the American Bowling Council approved balls. Top quality balls in 10, 12, 14, or 16 pounds and in five attractive colors. You'll be fitted right there in the sporting goods department. Your own personalized ball drilled for your hand and finger sizes will be delivered within one week. And if you order this week, it's only $17.88. Check out the sale on bowling balls this week at Meyer Thrifty Acres. Now let's take a look at that mystery fish we have with us this week. Here it is. Notice it has a blunt nose. It has a very small mouth. It has coarse scales that are silvery. Do you recognize it? It's a whitefish. Now, how big does a whitefish grow in Michigan? Well, you're looking at it. This is the state record, 12 and a half pounds. That's only a half pound short of the world record. Now, whitefish have occasionally been reported larger than that, but they've been caught commercially and not on hook and line. Now, the master angler minimum, by the way, for uh, uh, whitefish is six pounds. The average size caught by anglers is somewhere between two and three pounds. That's the same for commercial fishermen, too. Now, whitefish have been caught for years commercially, but sport fishermen only take about two, maybe 300,000 uh, most each year. Now, whitefish uh, are mainly bottom feeders. Their small mouths are used to get plankton and crustaceans down at the bottom, and that's why it's difficult for fishermen to catch them. But there are sizable populations in Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, Lake Huron. Why don't fishermen catch them? Well, they do catch them, but not too often when they're out trolling for salmon because they use such large lures. These are salmon lake trout lures. Uh, they're big, nice for a salmon or a lake trout that has a large mouth, but not for a whitefish. Stan Levensee from the Michigan Travel Bureau says that there are people catching them successfully off downriggers, but they use small lures like this, maybe a little spinner, a little uh, spoon, a lure of some type that is, you know, tiny for ultralight, six pound test line. Control this behind your downriggers, put some cowbells in front of these, put it right on the bottom, whitefish like about 53 degree temperature, and you should find some whitefish there. A lot of fishermen are marking fish on their graphs and they don't know what they are because they can't catch them. They say, we drag every lure in the book through there, can't catch them? Good chance they're whitefish. Here's a few hot spots for whitefish in this early spring and uh, early summer. You can catch them Grand Marais off the break wall. Sault Ste. Marie behind the power plant is a good spot. The east arm of Grand Traverse Bay is, is probably the favorite spot in Michigan where fishermen congregate for whitefish. Off Northport here on the west arm is also good. DNR says there are big populations off Port Austin here in the Thumb. Now, as far as inland waters go, uh, at Beulah, Crystal Lake, Torch Lake, Elk Lake, and Higgins Lake are proven white fishing waters, especially in the winter. You can fish uh, through the ice. But many anglers who catch whitefish just catch them as incidentals while they're fishing for another species or trolling. That's the same way that this state record was caught. Well, here it is, the state record whitefish. And this is being held here by Kevin Chippa, who's a charter captain down in Saugatuck. Kev, this fish was caught by who? Bob Worley of Munster, Indiana. So, uh, of course, he isn't able to make it up here for the show, and uh, it was caught on your boat. Isn't this unusual, or do you catch many whitefish? This is the first one. We've never caught any before. I've fished on Lake Michigan for 12 years now, and I've never caught one. This is the first one. Well, as we just talked about, uh, the size of the mouth of a whitefish has an awful lot to do with it. You can see right here, for such a huge fish, this fish has a tiny, tiny mouth. This is a 12 and a half pounder. We can also see it's an interesting thing here. A whitefish has an adipose fin, this little fleshy fin right here towards the tail. And this is the same thing a lake trout and the trouts will have. So a whitefish is actually related to the trouts. Another thing, uh, we can see if you can tilt the gills up here and get a shot here on the gills. Uh, this is, the, the gills have long filaments on them. And this is because the whitefish is a, partially a plankton feeder and it strains part of its food through there. So it doesn't normally hit on a lure as large uh, is this flutter spoon. 
That must have been quite a bite for him to take on that. <laughs> he had it all. Well, now, uh, tell me, what were the circumstances that led up to catching this? Uh, it was just a fluke, wasn't it? Well, it was in the evening. Whitefish do move in the evening. We had had another fish on. We actually weren't trolling at the time. We had another fish on, and I had put the boat in neutral, and we were actually just drifting. And the rod popped up off the release, and I'd pick the rod up, and it felt almost like we'd had a snag. Hmm. And I handed the rod, well, I held on for a while, and I felt a little wiggle. And I gave the rod to Mr. Worley, and he just kept fighting it. And in the meantime, he was fighting this one. I netted the trout we had had on, and finally this guy came up to the top, and at first I thought it was a carp, and at first I thought it was something else, but we finally got it in, and it was a whitefish. A whitefish, you've, you've never seen one this big, have I've you? I've never seen one this big. This, matter of fact, this is the biggest one in Michigan. Yeah, but not only the biggest one in Michigan, it's only eight ounces off the world record that was taken in Great Bear Lake. So that is a one tremendous fish. Well, how do you rate the whitefish as a fighter? He doesn't fight very well. He likes to stay down. It took a while for us to get him even up off the bottom. Mm -hmm. Where he was caught was down on the bottom. And once he just started coming up, he just came up and laid there. He doesn't fight that much. Hmm. How do you rate him as far as eating goes? Well, it's supposed to be one of Michigan's best eating fish. Well, it sure is, a very important commercial species. Well, thanks for bringing this down, Kevin. Yeah. This is probably the largest whitefish that you'll ever see taken from Michigan. Who knows, maybe somebody will break the record, but uh, that's something we'll have to cover on another edition of Michigan Weekend. If you think you'd like to try fishing for whitefish, here are the ground rules in Michigan. There is a year-round season. There's no size limit, but a daily limit of 12. If you catch one over six pounds, you can receive a master angler patch. Catch one over 12 and a half pounds, you'll receive a state record certificate. Now, some of the other master angler fish reported to the DNR recently include these. Here's a white bass that ties the state record, two pounds, 11 ounces. The unusual thing was that Julius Crop was trolling with a cast master in Van Etten Lake. That's in Iosco County. White bass are normally associated with Lake Erie. Quite a catch, ties the state record. Now, perch, one pound, 13 ounces. Little Jason Wright of Saginaw caught this in Tawas Bay, still fishing from a boat with minnows. Here's a very nice channel cat caught by Joe Worthman. Caught it in Cass Lake, Oakland County, fishing with a nine foot fly rod with a crawdad. That weighs 12 pounds, four ounces, a beautiful channel cat. Let's get up to the biggies though. Let's look at a northern pike here, caught by Dan Shuachow. From, uh, he caught this in Portage Lake, Houghton County. That weighs 21 pounds, 13 ounces. But let's go to the muskie category. Look at this, Great Lakes muskie caught by Thomas Baggs, Skigamog Lake in Grand Traverse County, trolling with a pikey minnow, 39 pounds, an incredible fish. Some mighty big fish being caught in Michigan this summer. And if you want to get up to date in fishing, in nature lore, hunting, outdoor events, you should be a subscriber to Michigan Out of Doors. For all Michigan weekend viewers who are new subscribers, you'll get half off this month. That's right, just listen. If there's one area of Michigan that's a trademark of our state, it's got to be the Mackinac area. The bridge, the city of Mackinac, Mackinac Island, thousands of people pass over the bridge every day on their way to the beautiful Upper Peninsula, and many stop to snap a photo of the bridge from Mackinac City. The little park just east of the bridge is enjoyed by many picnickers, a good place to sit down and enjoy a piece of fried chicken. The Mackinac City Marina is on the Lake Huron side of Mackinac City, right downtown. There are 96 boat slips and launching facilities. The straits are a pretty fair area to fish. In fact, most of Michigan's Great Lakes waters are good for fishing for one species or another. In the Mackinac area, there will be steelhead runs in the Carp River, as well as coho, browns, and lake trout have been planted in the area as well. And there are some excellent lake trout fishing areas around Bablo Island, which is just to the east of Mackinac Island. Now, if you don't connect on your fishing trip, you can still take fresh fish home. Bell's Fishery has been operating out of Mackinac City for years, and you can usually find Michigan's most delectable fresh fish ready to go. Of course, the three favorites are Lake Whitefish, Lake Perch, Big Jumbo Lake Perch, and Lake Trout. Wilderness State Park is located west of Mackinac City and it's a popular place with campers. It has a little over 200 campsites and lies in some beautiful territory. Even if you don't camp there, you should take a drive down the road that leads to Wagashans Point.
the road ends at Wagashantz Point, and if you'd like to get out and see some beautiful wetlands on Lake Michigan, here's your opportunity. Now the fishing off Wagashantz Point is primarily, uh, it's primarily noted for smallmouth bass. People get out there and wade, cast, and the smallmouth really go for this territory. It's uh, rocky, gravel bottom, good breeding territory for smallmouth. You might also catch an occasional pike, maybe even a, a muskie might wander into those waters. But it makes a, a great place to get out for smallmouth bass fishing, especially in the spring. Waterfowl are also attracted to this area with the shallow waters and the wetlands, and you'll see a number of duck hunting blinds up there that are semi-permanent along the shore. The city of Mackinac is not real big. It has several main streets, but much of the tourist trade is done right here close to the ferry docks. The year-round population of Mackinac City is about 850, but they're prepared to handle about 15,000 tourists a day. There are twice as many motel rooms in Mackinac City as there are year-round residents, and a lot of these rooms are very modern, right in the heart of downtown or on the outskirts. With twice as many motel rooms as permanent residents, you have to give Mackinac City an A for their efforts in tourist trade, or maybe even an A+. On the west side of town, you'll find the historic Fort Michilimackinac. It was originally built by the French back in 1715. It changed hands to the British, was momentarily commanded by the Indians in 1763, back to the British, and then in 1779, the British didn't think they could defend Michilimackinac against Mer American attacks in the Revolutionary War. So they abandoned the fort and moved to Mackinac Island. But the fort was restored in 1959 by the Mackinac Island State Park Commission, and now the public can tour the fort and experience some of the history that is the roots of the city of Mackinac. Each year over Memorial Day weekend, about 200 Mackinac City residents, and that's about one-fourth of the townspeople, take part in the annual Fort Michel Mackinac pageant. This is a reenactment of the history of the fort between 1715, when it was built, through 1781, when it was abandoned. Rehearsals go for a couple of days, and the reenactment is presented each day of Me Memorial Day weekend. And of course, the high point is the Indian Uprising of 1763. As soon as the first speech comes over, Jeff says, Jeff says something, something like, hey, we need we rifles, there's no, uh, we don't have enough ammo, and so on. And then die. he says, uh, he comes back and he says, I'm sorry, Mr. Vavon, I've given you all the shot and powder that I can. If I, any more, I'd be able to display my orders. I'm sorry, and uh, my, so, I'm sorry, just mm -hmm. turns turn and, and moves away. fast, and doesn't right look now, back. Fast. And the guys with the rifles back. over here right. are pointing them at us. On guard. Because they start making threatening gestures. Because we start making threatening gestures. And they kick rocks at you, and so on. Right. And if he knows what's good, he'll leave. Right. He'll leave in a hurry.
The Memorial Day pageant draws a lot of attention each year, but there's a lot to see and do all summer and fall in Mackinac City. By the way, Mackinac City is spelled the British spelling with a W, while the other Mackinac's end with a C, which is the French version. But they're all pronounced Mackinac, and that's your spelling lesson for today. But no matter how you spell it, Mackinac City, Mackinac Island, and Fort Michelin Mackinac are all beautiful attractions that make great places to go on a Michigan weekend. If you enjoy traveling, you can get Michigan Living Magazine every month by becoming a AAA member. This month, articles on Detroit, Michigan zoos, and other attractions. And in many families, AAA membership is a tradition. I hope Chuck likes the AAA card. Roger got one when he was 16, and I'll never forget the first time we used it. Roger, my folks said 10 o'clock. I think we better call my dad. Aren't we at the movies? I think we better call AAA. Yeah. Hey, thanks. What time is it? At the chime, 9.55. Oh. My own car keys. Triple A. My own triple A car? A tradition that starts on the day you drive. You drive carefully, okay. Sam. Kathy, why don't we head now down towards Battle Creek to the Kellogg Bird Sanctuary? That sounds like a good idea. Why don't you tell us about some of the waterfowl that are there? Okay, there's a, really a lot of interesting waterfowl down there. Roz Van Dusen, who's the director, has been director down there for many years, is quite an expert, especially on swans. And uh, I talked to him about some of the waterfowl habits and so on. For example, here that little wood duck going by is in its eclipse plumage. Uh, the, a lot of the waterfowl now are in their molting season, they're finishing it up, and it won't be until fall when they'll really be in the bright colors. But that'll really just be a few more weeks and they'll start taking on the, what's called the breeding plumage in the fall. These ducks, of course, uh, the ones we're watching here are called puddle ducks. They're skimming the surface, they just dabble in just a couple feet of water, straining plankton and duckweed with their bills. Do they eat the duckweed? Yeah, they eat an awful lot of duckweed, and as well as a plankton that, uh, that they find in there, microscopic plankton. Their bills actually have little serrations all around the outside edges, and they use that to strain some of this microscopic life. Now, the Canada geese are interesting uh, down there. Well, here we can see what they're doing is uh, oiling their plumage. They have an oil gland at the base of their tail, and they rub the oil over their feathers, their outer feathers, and that sort of waterproofs them and keeps their inner down dry and warm. Good insulation in summer and winter. There are about two to three hundred resident geese down there, Roz Van Dusen tells me, but this has attracted some 2,500 in the surrounding area. And of course, the swans down there, here's a whooper swan, it's a European. Interesting to look at. You can see how large it is compared with that Canada goose. Of course, it does the same thing with its bill. Swans and geese are dabblers, too. They feed on the surface. The ducks might go, you know, a couple feet under the water, but a swan with its long neck, they can reach down four or five feet. One popular thing about swans that I found interesting is that they eat filamentous algae. That's some obnoxious algae that uh, people find in the ponds and so on. So it makes the swans popular as uh, pond sweepers. What's this? It looks like black swans. Well, these are Australian black swans. Uh, there are a number of species there that Roz Van Dusen is important to the sanctuary, just to let people see what type of waterfowl there are in other countries and other regions. Interesting thing about the Australian swans is that both the male and female, that's the cob and the pen, help in the parenting duties. Uh, this is probably the female because she's working on the nest there. The other one left with the baby, which is called a signet, by the way, probably the male. But they'll switch off and do babysitting. In fact, they both at various times sit on the nest. Of course, the male does it more as a babysitter. He gets impatient, but <laughs> the female lets him sit there too long. But they're big, beautiful birds. Now, this one, uh, with a yellow bill and a black tip, is a whooper, whooper swan. Not to be confused with a whooping crane. Now this one with a black bill totally is a trumpeter swan. They grow very large. Some of these swans grow up to 30 pounds. And here's a white-fronted goose, a pair of white-fronted geese. They're called speckle bellies by hunters in the central flyway. They're also not really native to Michigan. They nest in Canada and fly down through Minnesota. But there are really just a number of 
ducks, geese, swans that you can find at the Kellogg Bird Sanctuary. Makes a great time to spend a Michigan weekend, and especially, as we said, as you get towards fall, they'll be coming in their breeding plumage and really be beautiful. Fred, that was great, but we haven't had a recipe today. Well, we don't, well, we sort of have a recipe, but uh, sort of a... we'll get onto that in a minute. But if you'll excuse me, I have to run. There's a sale on jogging shoes at Meyer Thrifty Acres. <laughs> I'll be right back. MTA Pro suede jogging shoes have durable gold suede leather uppers that allow your foot to breathe or go really lightweight and cool with the Rust Color MTA Pro nylon joggers. Both shoes feature a padded collar, cushion insole, excellent arch support, a sponge rubber midsole, and the traditional herringbone country outsole. And both are on sale this week at Meyer for only $10.94, sizes 6.5 through 13. Check out men's jogging shoes this week at Meyer. Okay, Fred, we're ready for the recipe. Okay, well, let's go, but I got to explain to you, this isn't really a traditional recipe. It's not in our summer recipe booklet, but it's, I think it's worth uh, hearing about anyway. I was fishing on a trip a number of years ago with Gabe Cherum. Uh, this was in my younger years. And, uh, Obviously. Yes, I was taking some pictures there, and he handed me a sandwich, which I put in my mouth. I saw a duck fly out. I want to get a picture of it, and I dropped my sandwich right in the water. <laughs> now, for most sandwiches, you know, uh, it would have been a disaster, but this was cooked by a special process. And my only comment to Gabe was I couldn't believe I could bring it out like that. And uh, It's a little tough. It was a little tough. I, I just said to him, well, Gabe, it's a little spongy, but not bad. <laughs> now, you can pick up other recipes, good recipes, in the summer recipe booklet, summer recipes for a Michigan weekend from any Meyer Thrifty Acres Sporting Goods Department or a AAA office. Pick one up. We'll have a good recipe for you next week. And we hope you can get outdoors next weekend because it's a great place to be. See you next week.